whole history uh, of human society uh, is a uh, uh, double thieving. We have first uh, stolen a lot of energy from the rest of the species. And what we stole, we didn't distribute it equally. We distributed it uh, unequally within society itself. So there are two ideologies that really uh, have allowed us to do this. One is what we call anthropocentrism. And I, in fact, dare say that a lot of people who talk about uh, violence uh, are very anthropocentric in their viewpoint because they look at violence only within human society and not what, not the kind of violence that human society has done to nature. Uh, and the other really is um, what I call private ownership of uh, nature and nature's products. Uh, so there is this double thieving that uh, we have done and all that is part of uh, our uh, DNA today. We have, we have used violence to do this kind of thieving. We clear felled 20 million square kilometers of farmland and in the last 8,000 years. And each year we have expended the amount of energy that is there in 20,000 Hiroshima sized bombs, multiply that by 8,000. That is the amount of violence we've done against nature. So, uh, you know, basically when you clear fell a forest, it's not just the tree that you're cutting. You are getting rid of all the species in that, or most of the species uh, in that forest as well. Now, when you compare what we the violence that we perpetuated against nature, which is uh, not what most people talk about, those who talk about uh, violence, uh, the genesis of our violence is there. If you ask a question, well, uh, other species also, you know, use force or energy uh, against uh, their prey. True, but they use it only for survival. We use it not just for survival, we use it for much more than survival. So as Gandhi said, it's not just, uh, you know, our needs, but it's our wants that we fulfill and it's the wants of a few. And therefore violence is uh, very much structural in our society. We have created institutions. The modern institution is the university or the school. And these institutions basically are institutions which encourage the growth of entropy. Now, do we now consciously start thinking about creating knowledge which creates, you know, which goes the, in the reverse direction, that is, goes towards negative entropy, okay? And do we eschew knowledge which actually creates more entropy? Well, it's out there. The questions are out there. It's for us to decide which way to go. I think if we go, if we want to go towards uh, ahimsa, it has to be, unlike with other species, a conscious choice that we have to make. And I think we have to make that choice uh, if we want to become a equal, uh, uh, sustainable and a peaceful society. Now for a long time, inequality was produced in the middle sector because uh, the surplus that was created was distributed uh, inequitably. The uh, crisis has developed now in the other two sectors, the environment from where we take resources because water uh, in fact, is going to be the first uh, resource where probably we will see water wars in the next couple of decades before we see energy wars. Uh, and at the other end, where we throw the resources and Mother Earth is saying that it can't really, it doesn't have the capacity to take care of the resources, the wastes that we throw, both at the local and the you know, global level, uh, we are uh, you know, seeing price. The most vulnerable regions in the world to global warming are the Sahel region of Africa and South Asia. These are the two most vulnerable regions, okay? Is share the wealth equitably and share the risks equitably. And you can do that only when you think not just as an Indian, but when you think as a global person. India should take, before other countries take those, those I have been to those parts of Bangladesh, to Kulna. Uh, they are much poorer than the Indians on, uh, of uh, who are on the Indian side of the Sundarbans mangrove forest. It is India's duty to take them. Similarly, Pakistan is going to have a huge problem. Uh, it has only one river, the Indus. The Indus River is dependent to the extent of 60% on uh, glacial melt and snow melt. 
none of the indian rivers that come from the himalayas <coughs> are dependent to that extent they dependent only to the extent of 10 to 20% the ganga and the brahmaputra what is going to happen after to the glaciers melt pakistan is going to be in dire straits what we are faced with today is the biggest epochal change human society has, has ever faced which is trying to dumb down anthropocentrism and private ownership of nature it's the biggest epochal change that you know we are looking at and much smaller epochal changes for example the fight against colonialism have never been done by governments they've always been done by people and this epochal change also has to be done by people the big problem is how do we get all the people of the world more or less onto one page